Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Mildred. I am a grateful recovered alcoholic. I live in Toronto. My home group is the Rocks Glen Traditional Group. My dry date is May the 18th, 1973. I have a sponsor, and I do sponsor others. Good morning to all of you. Hi. And now we're going for a ride. I woke up this morning and said, what am I doing here? I wonder how I could get out of this. You know, there are times I get up to the podium and I I just know. I just know that I have something to say. I was just saying to my good friend Rick, uh, I've really struggled over this. Rick, uh, Lee and I talked about, he asked me to do a workshop on spirituality. And I said, well, we discussed it a bit back and forth, and I said, well, how about we do it on the spirituality of the steps? And then it isn't just an academic exercise. So we agreed to that. Last night, I thought, I wonder how I could get out of this. (laughs) You know, uh, it's just a thing. Will anybody come? Will they all come? Will anybody like what I have to say? Sometimes I think people who sit in an audience forget that when you get up here, that does not mean you're fixed. It does not mean that you walk in bliss all the time and that the false self talks to you. So I had to finally say, Mildred, you know what you believe about spirituality, and that's what you have to be true to. So whether you feel like it or not, whether you feel excited and think, oh, I'm, I really have something important to say, go there. And if they like what you have to say, that's great. And if they don't, that's also a lesson. See, I think I've come to see over the years that my purpose on the planet is not to have fun. Sorry, I just don't see it that way. When I tried to have to live my life in such a way that I was going to have fun, I was doing immoral things, I was doing illegal things, and I was out of harmony with everybody and certainly out of harmony with God. And I think that if I know anything, it is that my experience is here to teach me something. And what my experience taught me is and from observing you, and from observing some of the really wonderful people that I have met, some of the wonderful people I have met, they are happy, joyous, and free. But they're not having fun in the traditional meaning of the word. I think back to a a party I was at um, last Christmas. And the host of that party was five weeks from death, and he was in immense pain. And he was the life of the party. Forty-five years sober, he knew what the deal was about. It was, for him, about seeking God. It was about, for him, about being present to you for those 45 years, a dedicated member of AA. I had a sponsee dying of cancer 11 days before she died. I'll never forget this. She was skin and bones. And I said, because I knew how much she liked to go out, so I said, how about you and I get dressed up, and I'm going to take you to a fine restaurant. Oh, she said, that would be great. And I knew what had been going on. She'd been having chemo. She'd been having radiation. She had been ill and was often in a lot of pain. But she believed in her God. I picked her up and 
practically had to carry her, and we went to this restaurant, and they made a big fuss over her because it was obvious that she was really ill. And as we were saying goodbye that afternoon, I can still see those big eyes. And she said to me, Mildred, it's okay. We've traveled this journey together well. You've taught me well. She said, every moment I've made a commitment to my God that every moment I get to live here on the planet, I am going to enjoy my life here. How do you, how do you beat that? It's not about having fun, is it? It is about being happy, joyous, and free. And, you know, I heard about being happy, joyous, and free, and I thought, that's for me. But I also knew that isn't the way life works. And I was very angry when I heard that. And I'd hear somebody, and, you know, I'm living on Skid Row, and I hear somebody get up here in their $1,000 suit and tie and shirt, and they look just great, and they're saying, oh, yeah, God wants me to be happy, joyous, and free, and I'm happy, joyous, and free, and I'm thinking, well, good for you. I'm not. With a belly full of resentment. I didn't understand. It says God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. It doesn't say, go do whatever you please, walk over whoever you want, lie, cheat, steal, Drink alcohol, shut me out of your life, and I'm going to make you happy, joyous, and free. I wasn't happy, joyous, and free. And so what I'm going to do in this seminar, I'm going to talk a little bit about those early days. What my experience of life without God in my life was like, and how I came to this process of finding peace within. Imagine, if you will, that we took an eye and we took one cell out of that eye and we put it up here on the podium. Do you think that eye cell would feel comfortable? It's not meant to be on its own, is it? It's meant to be part of the eye. And if it's going to function and have a good time, it needs to be part of the eye. It's satisfaction, it's excitement, it's aliveness, it's joy, it's health will never happen while it is isolated here on this podium. It needs to be part of an eye. And then it can be part of what an eye can do. And I think that's the way I was. Isolated, separate, me only, separated from the whole. Uh, Many years ago, we're not going to talk Facebook to Albert. Uh, I don't know who put that on. (laughs) I came to Alcoholics Anonymous the first time in 1966. And I'll get back to that. But... Chuck Chamberlain was alive at the time, and I was in Prince Albert, and Chuck used to come. There were a whole group of men who had been part of, uh, uh, they had been um, delegates, and then they were trustees at, in generals in New York, and they knew each other, and when there were conferences, they'd invite each other, and one who used to come a lot to Prince Albert was Chuck Chamberlain. And in those days... I went to AA for three weeks. That's as long as I could do it. Sober. I liked it. And at the end of three weeks, I was done. I wanted to stay in AA, so I stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I did it my way. I stayed for five and a half years stoned. And I have to tell you, (laughs) it just interferes with how you see the program. Just... (laughs) Just a teensy bit. And so, you know, everybody knew that's what I was doing. 
And I knew that's what I was doing, but I didn't know how to do it any better. I couldn't stand living without the anesthetic and the relief and the release that alcohol gave me. And so I didn't want to leave you people. So I stayed here, but I did it my way, and my way, of course, doesn't work. But what I'm getting to is that Cease, uh, how, any of you know Cease? A couple of you, Cease was my first sponsor. And so when Chuck Chamberlain would come, he'd always arrange for Chuck, me to pick Chuck up so that I'd be with Chuck and then we'd stop somewhere and Chuck would talk to me. And what Chuck would do would be, he would draw this diagram. And if any of you know the book, The New Pair of Glasses, uh, in there, he, this, this diagram or a version of it is, <clears throat> is, uh, uh, presented. And Chuck used to say to me, he never said, you know, you're a loser. He never said you're doing it wrong. He never said you're not right and we know what you're doing. He just said, you know, it seems to me that you're not too happy. He said, you know, I've learned something over the years that has helped me to be happy, joyous, and free. Yeah, right, Chuck. So he'd draw this diagram, and he'd say, we're all one. You know who else said that? The great Einstein. I didn't know this. I thought Einstein was just a great scientist. He was a great man. And I think that probably his spiritual growth was far more impressive than his, his intellectual scientific growth. Because this great man could say, I'm, he said, you honor me. He said, you're looking at the wrong thing. I'm just a man. It is the power within me. It is the intelligence within me that flows out and allows me to write the things and present the things that, that I am able to present. And then he said this, and it's kind of, I think, the basis of my spiritual growth. But it's also in the big book. And isn't it interesting? When we see the truth and we find it in science and we find it in philosophy and we find it in psychology and we find it in religion and we find it in, in spirituality and we find it in Alcoholics Anonymous. This turns me on. And we find it from thousands of years ago. The great masters said the same thing as the great masters are saying today. See, this is not about therapy. And as, as Rick, I think it was, said yesterday, this is not self-help. This is God help. This is God awakening. And that's what Chuck was saying to me. Einstein said, we're all one. That's what he said. He said, it's an optical delusion. I don't know how many hundred people are in the room, but I'm saying to you it's an optical delusion that there are 200 or 300 or 400 here. If what, if this is the truth, then the same life force that lives in me lives in you. And I think on that basis, we come to enlightenment or we don't get there. If I continue to look at your outsides and I say, yeah, and I don't like your skin color and I don't like your size and I don't like your age and I don't like the length of your hair and there's, I don't like how you behave, how am, how am I going to get along? The great teacher, when he was here, he said, how can you say you love God whom you don't see? when you don't love your neighbor whom you do see. I'm not saying that from a religious standpoint. I'm saying that from the standpoint of the kind of thing that Einstein said. He said there's only one of us here. It's an optical delusion that we're divided. It's like those eye cells. You can split up those eye cells and give them courses in self-esteem. Good luck. And you see, 
immediately a whole different a whole different reality takes place. And this then he went on, this is Einstein now saying. He said, and we better get it. Because he said, we now have the technology that if we continue to think of ourselves in terms of separateness and hatred and judgment and God knows what, we have the capacity to blow the earth apart. See? And then I think of my monk friend in London, England. He was asked to give a talk. He teaches meditation and things like that. And he was asked to give a talk on addictions. And he said, well, I I don't know anything about addictions. I said, you might want to go to some meetings. He went to some meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And this was what he wrote to me after a time. He said, in my opinion, Alcoholics Anonymous is the most powerful, global, transformative, spiritual program on the planet today. He was blown away in colloquial terms by the sharing that we do, the love we express for each other, our willingness to help one another. He just couldn't believe what he saw. I said, you might want to drink a little more. (laughs) You can come and join us on the high road. He didn't think that was necessarily a good idea. You know, and then there's one of your fellow Americans who wrote that book, Power Versus Force. And he says in there, he's studied Alcoholics Anonymous. He's a psychiatrist and a, and, and, um, a doctor and a philosopher, I guess you'd call him, but basically a scientist. And what he said was, he believes that 50% of the people in the United States and Canada have been influenced by Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we hear the detriment that that we are and the bad stuff that we bring and how many people are hurt by our drinking. Well, you know, we can turn that around. And that's what he saw. 50% because they've heard about recovery. They've heard about whatever it is that they've heard. They've known somebody who used to be a loser like me, and I don't sit on a park bench anymore. See? So, getting back to Chuck. See, that's what I do. I wander. (laughs) Getting back to Chuck. This is what he used to say to me. I'm stoned. And he's drawing this picture. And he's saying, there's only one. There's only one life. There's only one love. There's only one goodness, and it's in you. you got to be kidding. I had been taught about a God who was separate from me, up there, watching, and going to punish me for any wrong move I made, and I just had better be careful. He said, Your pro- our problem, if we don't get that and live from that spiritual experience, is that we develop this isolation, this sense of separation. Next time you're confronted and you're really stirred up by somebody whose behavior you don't like, you don't like what they said, you really want to punch them in the eye. Just like when Rick and I stood in the lineup on Wednesday and nothing was moving because the customs system, their computers were down and somebody came and parked yourself right in front of me. I wanted to hit her. (laughs) What was going on in me was not very spiritual. (laughs) I looked around at Rick, and he looked quite composed, so I thought, okay, get with it, pray. So I did, and I didn't hit her. (laughs) Um, One life. She's me. See, I don't think the golden rule is about, I'm going to be good to you so you be good to me. 
I think the golden rule is, I must be good to you because I'm made out of goodness. If I, if this is who I am, I am made out of that stuff. I'm made out of the goodness of God. And that is, of course, the prayer of St. Francis, isn't it? Let me be the channel. I'm not going out there to get the stuff. You know, the spider. See that spider up there in the corner? He's spinning away. And he's going to make a magnificent web by the time I'm finished speaking. Where does he get the juice to make the web? He doesn't go running across the ceiling saying, i got to find another spider and beat him over the head, and I'll get the juice to make my web. It comes from within. Everything comes from within. And that's what I think is the truth about me. If I will get conscious and remember it, everything comes from within. Isn't that why step four, in the beginning of step four, it says, we have to get rid of the things which had been blocking us. You know what I thought that meant? I thought the good stuff was out there. And it couldn't come to me because I had all these blocks. The men were out there, very good. Sex was out there, very good. Money was out there, houses, stuff, all the things that I thought were what this life was about. And I have to tell you, right as I stand here today, I believe it's about God. It's about God only. I believe that we come from God, we go back to God, and I believe while we live here, God lives in us, and we live in God. I think it's that simple and that profound. And that's why I think Chuck said, you already are everything that you can be. <laughs> to a stone person, this is not not interesting. <laughs> and he said, you already know everything that you can know. See, Chuck was a student of the spiritual life. And so he had studied, and he had obviously read chapter 2, the Agnostics, in which it says, the day will come when faced by a self-imposed crisis. Be that drinking alcohol, or be that trying to stop somebody from drinking alcohol, good luck. I love when you talk about that, Mary Pearl. <laughs> you too, Rick. Um, I know your stories a little more intimately than ours. Uh, or whether it be some guy dumped me, or I lost my job, or I haven't got enough money. It says, faced by a self-imposed crisis, and I thought there were no such things. It was always imposed by you. You were the problems. See? That's the attitude I came here with. No knowledge at all of how this thing worked. Chuck obviously knew. He said, turn within. You already know everything that you know. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't go to others, that we shouldn't go to the wise ones, that we shouldn't go to our sponsors. But I think it's also valid, and it's part of what our program gets us to, is that we learn to go within. That's what Step 11 is really all about. So, because you already know everything. Do you ever sit at a meeting and you hear somebody talking and maybe you don't even think it consciously, but you know that you know that information. You know that you know it. Where is it from? It's this, the God self of you talking. Well, this one causes all the trouble. This one thinks it's separate. I prefer to call it the false self rather than the ego because somebody will come along and quote Freud and somebody will come along and quote what, what Jung said about the ego and then Maslow and somebody else and then they say, well, you know, we have to have 
an ego. No, I don't. I have to have a sense of identity. And if my sense of identity is on the outside, that's precisely the problem. If my sense of goodness and my sense of strength and my sense of courage is coming from me, personal sense of Mildred, I've got a problem. I can tell you, I'm on this stage today not because of a personal sense of Mildred. I had to go deeper and say, God, you are within me, and if you want me to do this job, I must put one foot ahead of the other and get to that stage, and then you give me the courage and the wisdom or whatever is required to do this job. And now I'll go back to my notes. That's why I make notes, I, so that I keep myself honest. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous the first time in 1966, and I'll talk more about that because I don't want to spend the whole time telling my story. Uh, but enough to elucidate what I'm saying about spirituality. And I was happy there because my brother had gotten sober. My father said he was transformed. I wanted to be transformed. And I loved AA for three weeks. I was willing to park my hiney on a chair and let you fix me. I no problem with that. And then, you know, the book says drinking alcohol isn't the problem. It's not. It's the symptom of the problem. You know, in the uh, how it works, it says remember that we deal with alcohol. Dash, cunning, baffling, and powerful. That doesn't mean the alcohol is cunning, baffling, and powerful. It means how I deal with alcohol is cunning, baffling, and powerful. When they started to talk about spiritual ideas, I knew I was in the wrong place. I knew that believing in God was useless because God was a useless twit. The roof isn't going to cave in, don't worry. (laughs) And I knew that talking about spiritual things was a waste of time. And I completely shut down. And I spent the rest of that five and a half years drugged. I was going to meetings. I was reading the book. I was trying to do what they said. But that isn't what this deal is about. The thing about it was I saw your results. I saw the results. I saw it in your eyes. Those of you who said you believed in God, just like I saw it in Huguette's eyes that day she said to me, the eyes were shining. Every minute that God gives me, I am going to enjoy. Too much had happened in my life. I wanted to believe, but I just couldn't. And if you're sitting out there and you're in that place, hopefully I'll say something that you can identify with. I just couldn't believe. Too much had happened. And I lived in a very dark place where it seemed that no light could then or ever penetrate. But never underestimate the power. Never underestimate the power. You know, I think we've all got our horror stories, right? I have mine. I was mean. I was ugly. I was behind my walls. I was a whiner. I was a combination of everything you didn't want to face. And yet, I can tell you there today, There is one who has all power. That one is God. And through a process that I could not have imagined and I certainly couldn't have orchestrated, I can tell you today, I believe that life is about God only. We come from God. We go to God. And while we are here, we live in God. 
and God lives in us. And in proportion to my believing that, consciously getting that into my life, I live in the light. Not always. I still want to hit people sometimes, but that's also a spiritual awakening. (laughs) You know, if you're new, and I can imagine what you're saying inside, you want to come and talk to me, I'll be happy to talk to you. I know what it's like to sit out there and listen to this kind of stuff and just curse, you know. If you knew me then, and you know me now, you know that something happened to me. And that is described in every page. That process on every page of the big book and the 12 and 12. So I went looking in the book. And I'm just going to read you quickly just a few of the things I found. The frequent use of the word spiritual. The frequent emphasis on This is what you need if you are going to find a way to live. It says in the 12 and 12 at the beginning, we have here a set of principles, not spiritual principles. It says principles, spiritual in their nature. It doesn't say legal or monetary or anything else. It says spiritual in their nature if practiced, as a way of life, have the capacity to free the alcoholic from the compulsion to drink, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, and enable that person to live usefully whole. I'm useful today. I am not a wart on the butt of the universe anymore. (laughs) In the chapter two of the agnostics, it says, If you can't stop drinking and if you can't control the amount that you drink, you may be suffering from a disease which only a spiritual experience will conquer. When did your physician last tell you, hey, get a spiritual experience, you drink too much? Another place he says, these are not easy alternatives to face. To be doomed, doomed, that's a big word, to an alcoholic death. Have you ever seen one? It's not a pretty sight. Or to live on a spiritual basis. The likes of me says, is it got anything else to offer? (laughs) Another one, he said, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis for life or else. The book is never threatening. It's inviting. It's invitational. But this is kind of, find it or else. What did Carl Jung have to say of Roland Hazard, who was a hopeless alcoholic that he had treated for a year and then came back again? I'm a hopeless alcoholic. And of him he said, or he said to Roland when he came back, I have never seen one of your type recover. But here and there, once in a while, I have seen people who have had vital, vital spiritual experiences. And the old in them has been cast aside and their insides have been rearranged. Again, I'm paraphrasing. He said, I don't know how to bring that about. You know, at the time he wrote that, the great young was one of the great psychiatrists on the planet. I don't know how to bring it about, but he said, I suggest you go back to New York and you find a spiritually based program that you can get involved in and get active in it. And of course, the rest is, he did that, he went to the Oxford group and he met Ebby and Ebby met Bill and so on. Another place on page 25, it says, this is the great fact. Fact, not fantasy, not fiction, not an idea, fact, that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences that have revolutionized our whole attitude to life, to our fellows, to God's universe. 
And then in the appendix, he describes what a spiritual experience might be. I think a spiritual experience is that which happens. I would say, standing there in the airport, aware of the anger that rose in me because she, this woman, you know, walked in front of me and parked her suitcase in front of me. Who does she, doesn't she know who I am? Yeah, right. (laughs) That was a spiritual experience because I saw the anger in me. And that's another thing Carl Jung said. He said, you know, we would like to grow spiritually by looking at beings of light. He said, no, helpful maybe, but we have to look at our own darkness. And in looking at our own darkness, we might be motivated to find a power bigger than ourselves. Because I remembered on Wednesday morning when I stood there and started to pray, I remembered the anger and the rage in me most of my life and how it would just escalate and escalate. And I've often said, if I had been raised in a home with knives and guns, I'm sure I would have been the first child murderer. I wasn't raised in a home like that. In my home, you shut up. You, you isolated. You covered it up. But the rage, nevertheless, was like a volcano, and I experienced that again. And I have to remember, this is a daily reprieve I have. I have to make choices every day. I can't just say, well, you know, I've done these steps. I'm sober 34 years. Isn't it great? La, 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 la. It doesn't work like that. And then, of course, we get to step 12. You know, the more I think about this, the more I think... I used to just jump right ahead to, I'm I'm going to carry the message. When I hadn't wakened up spiritually, I didn't have a message to carry. The message that I hope I can carry today is that there's a spiritual solution for your obsession with alcohol or drugs or whatever the case is, but there's also a spiritual solution for whatever it may be. A problem in your family, you lost your job, you haven't got enough money to pay the rent, nobody seems to see you, nobody seems to care about you. That's what I believe, the spiritual solution. We learn about it through our drinking of alcohol and letting that go and being freed from the compulsion, but then we also learn that we can use that in our lives. I think the steps are so rich. They're so rich in meaning. They're so rich in opportunities to show us how to change. Because, you know, I've traveled uh, many places in this search for spirituality, and uh, there's none finer. There's no finer process than those 12 steps. And then you add to those steps the traditions, our common welfare should come first. You'd almost think Einstein was talking. Our common welfare should come first. And God speaks through each of us. You know, when we have business meetings, we don't rank our votes by how long you're sober. We have a perfect democracy. Everybody gets a vote. Amazing. Nobody says, well, you know, Mildred, you're sober 34 years, I guess, We'll give you 34 votes, and the newcomer gets only a half a vote. Thank God. So what about the references to waking up? See? If I'm awake, if I need to wake up, I guess the implication is I've been asleep. And as I started to way down the road in my sobriety, started to think about this, I thought, what what would it avail me if I were in a room asleep and I've got a serious disease and a great doctor comes into the room and says, I can heal that person, but I'm asleep. What good would it do me? None. I've got to wake up. 
and then I can respond. Or somebody came in and said, you know, I've got an extra million dollars in this bag. Who wants it? I wouldn't be there for the taking. I'm asleep. Spiritually, I don't think it's any different. I was that I sell, sitting here feeling alone, feeling nothing good was happening to me, feeling nobody loved me, life was scary, everything was wrong, you should fix it. And the truth of the matter was, I was asleep to the only thing that mattered, the God within me, see? And so I I do believe we walk in this nightmare, and it's not about our neighbors. When I walked in the nightmare, it was always about me, me, me. Now, are we the only people who, who thirst for God? Because I think that's basically it. In The Course in Miracles, it talks about our thirst. And in The Course in Miracles, it talks about our helplessness living in this dry and dusty world where starved and thirsty creatures come to die. I read that and the tears sprang to my eyes. Living in this dry and dusty world where starved and thirsty creatures come to die. That described many years of my life. But you know, it doesn't matter how long it takes because God works with us. I'm sure of that. He sends people into our life, but always it's the power of God within us charting the course that is perfect and that you in your life could never decide upon and I certainly in my life could never have decided upon because every decision I made, I always had to filter it through that false self picture. You're wrong. I've got to find a way to get you to do what's going to make me okay. There is a path to insanity. And I have to tell you, I've been in mental institutions, insane asylums, and psych wards 32 times. That should tell you something. (laughs) What have some of the great masters said about this? Have you ever been really thirsty? Can you remember a time when you were really thirsty? Hmm? How many can? Where you would have done just about anything to get a drink. Not necessarily of booze, just thirsty. I read something in the paper not too long ago where some people had been uh, shipwrecked and they said they drank their urine. Right. That's thirsty. (laughs) Some of the stuff I drank tasted like urine. (laughs) What does the Bible say? The Bible in one of the Psalms puts it this way, as the deer pants for water, so does my soul pant for you, O God. Isaiah, 5,000 years ago, said, wake up, get up, and put on your beautiful garments. That to me is the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. Wake up, get up and put on your beautiful garments and go live. The Greeks, above the porticos of their temples, had written, Man, know thyself. And I, in my wisdom, thought they were wrong. I thought they should have written, Man, know thy God. But the truth of the matter is, Man, if you know yourself, you will know you are not God. You will know your God. You'll know that there's something bigger than you are. And then there was St. Augustine, the bad boy of the third century. And his mother was St. Monica. And Monica prayed for him and prayed for him because he was really the bad boy. And when he was converted, he wrote that book, The City of God. Not easy reading, but one of the things that he wrote in there was, Thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Restless. We've heard that before, haven't we? Dr. Silkworth. 
We alcoholics are restless, irritable, and discontent until we can again experience the ease and comfort that come from taking a few drinks. Or, as Mary Pearl and Rick pointed out yesterday, from finding somebody they could help. (laughs) And then there's that beautiful poem, The Hound of Heaven. Again, You know, it's written in very old English. It's not easy to read, but there are a couple of quotes. Francis Thompson was an alcoholic who did come to sobriety, but of course there was no A. He was born in 1859 and died in 1907. And he wrote this poem, The Hound of Heaven, in which he pictures God as the hound chasing somebody. And this is Francis Thompson saying... I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. Identify with that? Yeah. And the hound speaks to him and says, All things betray you who betray me. See, you get the money, you get the houses, you get the stuff, you get the sex, you get the men, you get the whatever turns you on, and one day you sit there and say, this isn't it. I thought this, and so he says, all things betray you who betray me. And then he describes this this denuding process. He says, my harness, piece by piece, you have hewn from me, my defenses, my old beliefs, my old ideas, the stuff that I believed so heavily in. You have smitten me to my knees, and I am defenseless utterly. I slept and woke to find that I was stripped in sleep. Again, I think that's a perfect description of what happens. That's why I say this journey of the soul, it's, it's written about in so many places. And... God says, or the hound says to him, All I did take from thee I took not to harm you, but that thou mightest seek it in my arms. All that you fancy lost I have stored for you at home. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. That's the invitation of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the invitation of a good group. That's the invitation of a good sponsor. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. That's what my friend the monk saw at good meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Rise, people were saying, take my hand, come. How many songs don't we have? One, I took one little quote where he says, poor wayfaring stranger, traveling through this world on his lonely way back home. And then, how many songs reflect this? I want to go home. Home. For some of us, that's not, a, that's not an image that carries a lot of depth or a lot of comfort because home wasn't a safe place. Home wasn't a place of comfort. Home wasn't a place where we were nurtured and where we felt, oh, this is good. And then we've got Dr. Silkworth. We're restless, irritable, and discontent. And I could say angry, manipulative, controlling, jealous, all kinds of things, until we can again experience ease and comfort. I love those words. Sometimes when I'm not feeling good, I just say them to myself, and I just kind of settle right down. Ease and comfort. Carl Jung, this is what he said. The craving he felt in alcoholics, because you see, Carl Jung at some point broke away from Freud, because Carl Jung was becoming, he came to see, as he saw what was really going on, that our souls are searching for God. And so he said he thought that the craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of our being for wholeness. That's what he said. And another time he said he felt 
that alcoholics in every bottle of spirits, with a small s, were seeking the spirit with a big S. I buy that. And we sure seek some strange stuff, don't we? You know, uh, I have sought some strange stuff, and I bet you have too. Things like power, symbols of power, friends who would fix it, friends I could fix. I've got a little al non in me too. Money, promotions, titles, information, education, entertainment, distractions, travel, romance, sex, alcohol, drugs, food. Good list, isn't it? Got any to add, J.D.? You look like the kind who probably could. (laughs) What's the results of that seeking? One, there's never enough. Two, I always need more and better. Three, four, pain, dissatisfaction, depression. Where do I go? I thought I had it. I own all these houses. I have all this money. I've got a big house. I've got the red convertible. I've got men. I've got this. I've got that. Not right in here. Depression, anger, fear, violence, hatred. So, what's the problem? I think St. Augustine said it. Thou hast made us for thyself, O God. And our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. We look for the solution on the outside. And I think that's why resentment, it was for me, is the number one offender. I am never angry or resentful if I don't demand from you what only God can give me. When I start thinking, you're not giving me enough, and you should do your life different, and if you were different, I'd be different, I can be a barrel of anger, and then if I don't say anything, if I stuff it, then I get a resentment, and then we've got some not nice stuff going. See, we can never get enough of what we didn't want in the first place. It doesn't work. And our book says either God is everything or God is nothing. Jung said another thing. He said, God is what we seek. And we become sick when we seek anything else. And that's why I think, if that's true then addiction is a misplaced attempt to find satisfaction. And if we think that because I'm not drinking, I'm okay, my addiction isn't settled. It's not until I do this. I am part of the spiritual change that allows me to say it's about God and God only, because otherwise, You've seen it. We sure see it in Toronto, where people give up one addiction, and then they take on another one. And then they that one doesn't work, and they take on another one. See? So if we look at what the addiction is really about, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try and fix, you know, uh, the symbols, but they're only the symbols. And the book says it. It's only the symptom. Liquor is but a symptom. It's like the Titanic. You know, they say icebergs, about one-tenth of them appear above the water. The nine-tenth that's going to sink the Titanic is not visible. It's below the water. So... What I'm going to do, see, just to bring this to, because I'm sure there are some of you saying, yeah, that all sounds good. (coughs) Yeah, right. Why doesn't she get with it? In my opinion, spirituality 
True spirituality makes a difference. Now, I went to a convent when I was 18 years old. I was, you know, I understand it today. I was trying to force God to make my life okay. Not how may I serve you, God. It was, you better serve me. I'm going to go to the convent. I don't want to go. I don't want those vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. I don't want that monastic discipline, but I'm going to do that. And when you see the hard thing I've done for you, you're going to fix my life, right? Wrong. I came out of there sicker than I went in. And that's saying a lot. The way I look at it, true spirituality makes a difference. See, I went to the convent. I was one of those people Bill talks about. I hated everybody because I blamed everybody. I blamed my family. I blamed the school. I blamed everybody that came across my path. I didn't know better, but I still blamed you. And so I went to the convent so that I could deal with you crapheads. I'm going to get spiritual. God and I are going to just, we're going to get going on this thing. And then I'll be able to deal with that part. And I don't believe that today. Spirituality is about change on the inner. It's about how I see you. And if I see you as I see myself, then it becomes, how do I treat you? How do we cooperate together and all kinds of things and then spirituality makes a difference you know is there a change in the way you live because you do spiritual work you know I don't think it's just going to change overnight but I do think that the persistence of the illusion that I'm that separate I self is going to go through a healing process So, back to the book, I Know What Won't Work. No middle-of-the-road solution. Frothy emotional appeal won't work. Human power won't work. My power won't work. Willpower won't work in the service of self. Self Self-knowledge won't work. Fear won't do the job. Managing well to wrest satisfaction out of this world won't work. The problem isn't outside. The problem is always a spiritual crisis in here. It's always about my relationship to God. You know, Carl Jung said something else that really explains me. Because I had a lot of religious convictions. I spent years studying theology and all kinds of stuff. I taught dogmen. I taught all kinds of things. This is the shocker. He said, while many had religious convictions, and these were very good, they did not spell the necessary vital spiritual experience. Just imagine that. You can know all this stuff, and it's not the same as a vital spiritual experience. Whoa! How do you get a vital spiritual experience? I think you have to be knocked off your horse. You have to be knocked. That I, that's what happened to me. And I'll explain that a little bit. He says, vital, what will work is a vital spiritual experience. An entire psychic change. He says, you know, Fred, he, t- he too when he came in. He didn't need a, a prin, spiritual principles. And yet what he found after his big bender, he, found, he said spiritual principles would solve all his problems. That just seemed like goofiness to me when I heard it. What do you mean? I'm living on skid row. I need money. I need a man who can work. I need a house, I need a job, I needed all kinds of things. Spiritual principles are going to solve what's wrong in my life. Get lost. He also says, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out 
in every way. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great things will come to pass for you and countless others. I haven't encountered a thing in my life that that doesn't apply to. See to it that your relationship with God is right, and great things will come to pass for you and countless others. You know what Meister Eckhart many, many years ago said? He said the soul grows by subtraction. Subtraction of what? All those old ideas, all those phony beliefs that have kept us so stuck in the old ways, defending, blaming, criticizing, hating, all that stuff. So, I'll tell you one story, and then I think we'll take a ten-minute break. You do know that Mary Pearl and J.D. are doing a workshop on relationship, and I will not have a fit up here if you decide to go to that. If you decide you want to come back here, that'll be fine, but I think we'll take a 15-minute break. But I just want to tell you one story, and then we'll take a break. My stuff started when I was a little girl. I don't know. You know, maybe we've lived many lives before and we bring stuff. I don't know. But the fact was, when I woke up to consciousness, I was crying. I was three and a half. And I was angry. And I was full of fear. And I was lying in bed with my sister who they said was retarded. She was injured at birth. She couldn't learn as fast as other kids. And so what happened with her was uh, they didn't know how to handle her. I'm 74, so that's three and a half years ago. No, 70 and a half years ago. I was three and a half. And uh, <laughs> they didn't know what to do. The school system didn't know what to do. They just called her dumb. They called her retarded, and so they kept her in grade three till she was 16. Can you imagine that? Her name was Dorothy. The kids called her Dora, and they called her dumb Dora, and she cried. See, she at that point was not surrendered to her journey on the planet, and she, we all need comfort. And where did she go for comfort? She came to me. I was three and a half, and I'd cry with her. And if you'd taken a two-by-four and smacked me across the head, you wouldn't have hurt me nearly as much as that. And I became dedicated to stopping that crying. It's got to stop. And, of course, I have had eight other brothers and sisters, and they loved me. Simple. I'm going to tell them how they should treat Dora they're going to treat Dora, not that they were mean to her, but they've got to make up and we've got to do something to stop this crying, and then I'll be happy. You know what happened? They couldn't change the course of somebody's life. I understand now that they did love her. They did what they could for her, but that's not what I saw. I saw people. I asked them to help me, and they didn't. And I grew up with a set of beliefs that I lived with and that drove my life for almost 60 years because I didn't know what was happening. My belief system went like this. Nobody cares. They don't care. Nobody helps me. I'm all alone here. I can't fix it, and they won't. And I was scared. That's the way life looked to me. I must not be important. If they saw me as important, they'd do what I wanted. And you see, we lived in a family where, well, 
70 years ago, we didn't have Oprah to elucidate things for us, and Dr. <laughs> Phil, and Mari Povich, and God help us. Now everything is fair game. Nobody talked about that stuff in our house. And so I kept it inside. I kept it inside, and on the outside, I was a nice little girl. I smiled and smiled, as Shakespeare says. You smile and smile, and he's a villain. What was going on inside me was pretty awful. And I didn't know, you know, how that could all be resolved. I did my best to do for her. And then at five, I picked up a drink. I'm an alcoholic from the word go. My first drink was a good belt of my father's home brew. And I was off to the races for the next 35 years. And as you know, when you drink, you cover everything up. You shut down the voice of God. You don't change. And so it goes. And that's where I'll pick it up. It's quarter after. Could you be back if you wish to come back at 1030? Thank you so much. The saying to David, you know, uh, two, you know, there are two popular, if you will, uh, workshops. One on spirituality, but also people want to hear about relationships because many people find their relationships are in trouble. So. I can understand they want to do that. Anyway, whoever's here are people who want to be here, so we'll continue. Let's just take a minute to turn within. We won't say a prayer. We said that at the beginning, but we'll turn within to the Spirit of God within us and just to the silence. It's a beautiful thing to do. Thank you. Hopefully we'll get to step 11. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about meditation and what it can do for you. See, I've a long time ago learned that I can't fix myself. I've a long time ago given up that idea that I know what the right way is and that if I'm going to change... Life is going to send you appropriate challenges. It certainly has me. None of this business, well, now, you know, I'm 34 years sober. I just, you know, cruise along every day and everything's easy. I've got a big challenge in my life, just like some of you might have. And uh, I say again, uh, if I want to meet it properly, uh, meditation is the place to go. So... I left off talking about where I had taken a drink at five. I come from a family that, my family isn't alcoholic, but my grandfather, my mother and father were Americans. And um, my grandfather died in a pool of his own blood. And there was no AA to stop that in the late 1890s. So uh, my fa- on my father's side, there's alcoholism, too. And in our immediate family, I have a brother who was dying when um, I left home to go to the convent. And as it turns out, and I'll talk about that tomorrow in my talk, he got into AA and was sober 49 years when, when he died. But <clears throat> I was absolutely addicted from that first drink. You know, some people slip into it more slowly. I had no defense against the first drink right from the word go. So I don't have to tell you that I didn't grow. See, when you can make the bad stuff go away by taking a drink, you're not going to be trying to to change and do the things to find out how you can live peacefully. So... I went to the convent, as I told you before. 
uh, I didn't go with ideas of piety and I'm going to become a spiritual. What I went for, as I told you, was I'm going to do this hard thing for God and then God is going to do for me. That was the quid pro quo. And I can tell you, I, as I said, I came out of that place more sick when I left than when I had been there. I went in there drunk. Uh, they allowed, I, I was, I got a great education in there. I studied a lot of theology. I knew a lot of stuff. And that worked against me because I had a head full of stuff that was irrelevant. See, I, I believe that God must be an experience. Intellectual stuff is not an experience. The intellect can become an avenue of awareness. So I can read a book or I can go to a talk and I can hear some things, but if I don't put it into practice, it's just information. And so when I came into AA later on, um, people thought I knew. She's an ex-nun. They assumed a spirituality in me that I didn't have. And so I came out of the convent, and the next ten months were absolute disaster. I left the church. Do you mind pulling that door shut back there? Thank you. Um, I think the next ten months I could describe as uh, the dance of the walking damned. And I left the church, and I left the church not because the church hadn't harmed me. I just realized at some point I didn't fit there. And so that brought me then to 1966, to Alcoholics Anonymous, and five and a half years where I didn't drink, but I was I was always stoned. And then I left Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I lost everything. I had married my psychiatrist, which isn't a terribly smart thing to do. <laughs> he, too, was alcoholic, so, uh, you know, uh, he couldn't protect me. And um, he started to drink again. We lost everything. And so by the time... Um, 1973 came. I had no home. I, we had no money. Everything was gone. There wasn't something, you know, where we could say, well, there's money stashed away somewhere. We were alcoholic. So was he. And so we lived the way alcoholics do, and one day it all just came crashing down. I told you I have a long history of psych wards, shock treatments, all kinds of things like that. Am I doing something to rattle this? Should I take that off? Okay. Um, The morning of May the 20th. See, we're talking about spirituality. And how does God enter? How does God enter our lives? Well, he doesn't enter. He's never been away. God is the essence of our being. How does God learn? How does... How does God deal with us in such a way that we will let God express in us? That's the question. And so the morning of May the 20th, I'm in a psych ward, and uh, I'm something had happened, and the nurse said to me, you know, she said you, she was trying to tell me what big trouble I was in. I weighed 85 pounds. I had teeth knocked out. My hair was straggly. This eye was purple, and I had a big purple whatever around. And uh, I said, I'm a woman of the streets. And she said, yes, you are. What are you going to do about it? I didn't know. So I went back to my room. What are you going to do about this? And I knew that I was out of everything absolutely out of everything. If you had come to me and said, 
I have got a job for you and I'll pay you a half a million dollars a year, I'd have had to say, I can't take it. I was totally broken. And um, so I decided. I didn't know. I had another idea in my head. So I decided I'm going to take my life. I'm done. My family didn't want me. They'd let me come home, but they wouldn't let me drink. I need to drink. I can't survive. And so uh, people had said, stay away from us. You're bad news. And uh, so I um, decided to take my life. I asked the nurse to bring my clothes. She went away to bring my clothes, to get my clothes. I was going to leave because I knew how to take my life, and I'd be gone in half an hour, and I had no qualms about that. I was done. And uh, do you mind closing that door at the back? And uh, in that moment, I had a spiritual experience. It was as if a giant hand reached into me. I was 40 years old, and I had never taken a sober breath if I could draw a drunk one. I'm not saying I was drunk every day, but that was my ambition. I drank all the time, any time, and I did anything I could. And uh, in the midst of that, this is what happened. I can't tell you anything else because it's God's truth. It was something happened to me, reached into me, it felt like, and took the compulsion to drink, and I knew it was in a heartbeat. Done. Done. And I knew that I didn't have to drink again. I knew it was it was gone. I can't tell you how I knew my soul knew that I had been it had been cleaned away. And I remember that morning because I also knew that I couldn't stay sober if I didn't change. And I didn't know how to change. I had I just knew it. I knew from within what the deal was. And so um I said to whatever that thing was in my room, you got to send me somebody because I don't know how to live. See, I started drinking when I was five, and I think my whole development was arrested at five. I didn't know how to do relationship. I didn't know how to get along with people. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how to get along with God. I didn't know anything. And I said, you'll have to send me somebody, and if you do, I will obey. And there was a rap on the door as I stand here. A man stood there, and he was the instrument who got me into the hospital, into Donwood, which was a hospital started by Dr. Bell for addicted people. And uh, I was there 28 days, and uh, at the end of that time, they gave me enough money that I could get a room on Skid Row. And I lived the first year of my life in sobriety on Skid Row. I did not believe in God. No, that's not right. I believed in God, the useless twit. I believed it it was useless, that whole business of spirituality, useless. And so I have to tell you, I lived, the best way I can describe it is, I didn't suck up much oxygen. I lived very small. I put one foot ahead of the other. I got a job sweeping floors. And uh, the compulsion was gone. I had all my belongings in a little plastic bag and a little suitcase. That was where my life had come to. The ex-nun, the well-educated woman, the woman who comes from a family whose name is Integrity, and on and on. And this is where I am. I didn't fight it. I didn't try to get out of it. I just did what I had to do. My husband, the psychiatrist and surgeon, he couldn't get past his qualifications. He just couldn't. He sat depressed. So I went out and I did what needed to be done. And this is where discipline comes in. This is where commitment comes in. This is where ability sometimes to do what you don't want to do, where you just say you can't do it, where you just put one foot ahead of the other. And that's what I did for six months. Hated AA. I'm not going to you, bunch of losers. You didn't fix me. 
See, I think what you need to understand is that spiritual experiences are given for a very specific reason. The spiritual experience I had removed the compulsion to drink very effectively. It did not change my life. See, that's the God-given process that we have to go through so that we'll change, so that I will live different. Nobody can pour that in. And that's why there's no instantaneous change. If, and I've seen it over and over, if a miracle so-called is required, you get it. But it moves you to the next piece. And that's what this did. And after six months, I can't even, you know, I think about that often. There were days we had no food. Uh, The only money I had was the money I made from sweeping the floor, and I didn't ask anybody for anything. I didn't try to manipulate anything. The only thing I did was my old shtick. The damn husband, if he just got his act together. See, that's an old idea in me, that if you changed, I'd be okay. If you changed and did what I need you to do, then I'd be fine. And there's never been a bigger lie on the planet. And I found it out in those six months. And one morning, I went to Donwood because they they had an AA meeting there. And... uh I didn't go for that, not going to that bunch of losers. And um, a man met me in the hall, a chance meeting. And he said, would you like to come to a meeting with me? And he smiled. And I said, sure. I didn't ask what meeting. And it was a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I don't remember much except that in the next three months, people, they didn't care that I was ugly. They didn't care that I wasn't well-dressed. I could hardly put two sentences together. That's how broken I was. And uh, they just said, keep coming back. And then I chose a sponsor. She had gold, She had blonde hair, gold earrings, and a white suit. Aren't those brilliant qualifications for a sponsor? Yet she told me one thing she said that I needed to hear. She said, you can get well even if your husband doesn't. And she kept saying that. And then she'd complain about her husband. But she had given me the message I needed. That was her shtick. I heard what she said. And I kept going to those meetings. She got drunk. And two guys in the group stepped up to the plate and said, Mildred, you are going to have to do the steps. And I did the steps the first time. And they told me what to do. They said, you come an hour and a half early. We'll be here. We'll read you the book. We'll tell you what to do. And that's exactly what happened. And the night before I went to do my fifth, I read over as they told me to do. I did exactly what they said. I read over my fourth step, and the light bulb went on. I was 41 years old at this time, and I had not a clue that you were not my problem. And I I saw it. You're the problem, Mildred. That was the gift of that series of doing the steps. And then I got another sponsor, And uh, he did the steps with me again, and it was quite a different experience. He didn't so much stress the spiritual. He, he, we did the steps, but, you know, and I can't go into it, but he taught me so many things about how to be an adult in this world. And that's a form of spirituality, too, because I didn't know how to do many things. And then... For the next 10 years, I made money. I'm a teacher, a high school teacher, but also uh, I started buying houses, and I made piles of money. And you know, this was a really important thing for me because somewhere in my psyche, I believed 
that if I could have lots of money, I'd have power, and I could buy my way into happiness, and I could travel first class, and I could do this. Remember, I'm the girl who sat on the park bench for weeks and panhandled for, you know, and slept with whoever to get enough booze so that I could, you know, jump off this world for a little while. And um, one day I sat in my fine house, and I said, this isn't it either. And I was 18 years sober, and my life started to unravel big time. And I can't go into all of it because I do want to go through some parts of the steps. But I realized at that time that no human power could fix what was inside me. What happened was I would go to meetings and I'd say to some of the old timers, see, spiritual growth doesn't stop because you've done the steps. You've got to keep growing. It's like if you want to be a university professor, for example, and you want to stay on top of things, you've got to keep studying. You've got to keep writing papers. You've got to keep researching. You've got to keep growing. And I think it's the same with the spiritual life. And I know that now. I'd go to the older members and I'd say, I don't feel good. And they'd say, go to more meetings. And I did go. It didn't answer it. And then at 21 years, I decided to take my life. I just figured, one more time, I know the truth. The program works for you. Do you ever think that? Anybody ever have that idea? The program works for everybody else but it doesn't for me. Yeah, it worked on the outside. I've got stuff, and I've got money, and I've got this, and I've got that. But I don't feel okay. And one more time, I had a spiritual awakening, and I knew it was going to be okay. I just knew it was going to be okay. And I got out of bed the next morning, and I put one foot ahead of the other for about three weeks. And then one day, the phone rang, and it was a Jesuit saying, Would you like to come and give retreats? I've been excommunicated oftener than Carter's has pills. Do you want me to give retreats? Yes. And that started the process. And at that very first retreat, all of a sudden I started to cry. I don't cry. Maybe with men once in a while if there's a strategic advantage. <laughs> I don't cry in front of women. And I bawled. And I heard myself say, and you know, I'm saying, never underestimate the power of grace. Because I heard myself saying, you know, I'm 20, I was at 22 years sober, 21 years sober. And I said, I don't have a friend in the world. I have lots of acquaintances, but no friends. And it was as if God took the walls that separated me from you absolutely down. And I just stood there bawling. And I said, would some of you be willing to have a cup of coffee with me? I'd like to see if I could become a friend. And that's where a whole new level of life started, you see, because... As long as I was stuck behind those walls, I couldn't grow. I need you to park your suitcase in front of me and bring up that anger. I need those experiences. I need the nurturing that you give me. I need to be able to nurture you. I need the dance of life. You see? We'll get to the steps, but it's all about the steps. Took my shoes off. Here we go. See, this is stuff I didn't know. And I think Bill opens the door for this in 
step eight in the 12 and 12, because you know that Bill didn't come into the, onto the, into A, or start AA. He was, so, he was depressed for 15 years. And later on, he wrote about this. He said, we've had experiences in childhood that have, that have twisted us, that have later discolored our personalities and altered our lives for the worse. He said, I learned. He told his spiritual director, I knew I needed to be number one to be safe. See, my shtick went like this. You have to fix my life. I can't do it. I'm just a little girl. Right back to being five, you see. Uh, and I think that the whole, the whole spiritual journey comes alive when you understand a, a couple of things. Certainly helped me. And one is that we come in this two-in-one package. We come with a body and we come with a soul. But where does childhood, what do we get in childhood? And this is not about blame mama and papa. They did the best they knew how to do. We as a race are growing. We're changing. We're getting some of this stuff. But I think it's fair to say that for most of us, the emphasis was on the body. This is how you grow up. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. And then you'll be okay. We learned how to get the good stuff. I learned that a lie here or there, you know, flatter my father, whether it was true or not. That got me a lot of good stuff. I learned how to avoid the bad stuff. I told lies and I cheated and I did whatever was necessary. And I had my plan for happiness. You change. You do what I want. I don't want much. You just do what I want. Cooperate with me. I'll be perfectly happy. And, you know, the tribe, our family, our, you know, our nationality, our whatever. Carolyn Mace talks about that. They don't want us to change. They want us to stay with this. And the spiritual journey is the diametric opposite. The spiritual journey says, pay attention to who you are in your God-given identity. And that might mean sometimes that you have to venture forth and take actions that a family doesn't agree with. See? That's what life is about. You know, I think that when we move forward spiritually, we don't necessarily move as a family. Isn't that true? You know, somebody starts this spiritual stuff and the rest of the family says, what the hell's going on there? <laughs> All I wanted you to do was stop drinking. <laughs> do you have to get into the... I see that you relate to this. See? You have to go to these meetings and you have to meditate for God's sake. Make breakfast! So, sometimes, you know, that's why I think if you talk to people that that's one of the things we provide for each other is support. And I think also what happens on this is that you find the people of like mind and like soul and like growth who can support you. You know, I have a teacher in California. I go see him because he supports me. He teaches me. He gives me ideas. He helps me to see what's happening in my spiritual growth. And it's fantastic. I need that because it's like a sponsor in AA. The sponsor in AA can... can because they've walked the way before. See, and as far as our soul is concerned, how many of you were sat down by somebody when you were a little child and told, you know, you have a wonderful spirit living in you. 
It's a spirit that made the universe, that made you, and it's available to you all the time. I sat down with a young man the other day who came to see me. He's about 32. I call him young. When you're 74, 32 is young. And uh, he said, not that I regret being 74. And uh, I said that to him. I said, you know, the Spirit of God lives in you. I said, you're beautiful inside. The goodness of God is in you. And he started to cry. He said, nobody ever told me that before. See? And so, that's not to blame. But once we know that, then we can start to radiate that energy. We can start to treat people like that. I don't have to set everybody down and say that to them. But when I meet you, I can deal with you like that. What instead... Well, I'm going to leave that for now. See, Chuck gave me the diagram that I showed you at first. And as I started to think about that, yes, I believe we're all one. But one day in meditation, it came to me. There are different parts of our life. We live in a body. I always thought the body was alive. I don't believe that anymore. It's my spacesuit. I just put it on for a couple of years. And when I'm done with it, I'm going to take it off again. That's all. What the body does for me, it enables me to dance here. It enables me to experience life, because otherwise I could live up in my head, and I could be dead wrong about that. What's alive in me is this spirit. That's who I am. And so, why can't I live that way? Well, the book says it. You and I, if you're alcoholic, we have these the body. If you put alcohol into it, we get what is known as an an allergy which shows up as a craving. Well, case closed then. Just don't put the alcohol in. What's the problem? The book says the main problem, main problem, rests in the mind. And I'm using a translation, uh, you know, my own version of it. I always thought the mind was the intellect. I don't believe that anymore. The mind is the inner world. The mind is all that stuff we learn, the old ideas. You're not good enough. You're a piece of garbage. You'll never amount to anything, and so on. All those nice ideas that we grow up with. And I think everybody has them to a certain extent. Our judgments, our memories, our values, our old thinking, our prejudices. The things we saw, the things we heard, the things we repressed. That's what that inner world is made of. And when I saw that, I said, bingo, that's what's going on here. See? And I didn't know that, that that this had so much power. According to the prayer of St. Francis, the life force is within me, and I'm to be a channel for the light. I'm to be a channel for good. I'm to be a channel for the good stuff. But if the ch- if this life force that is within me and in you has to go through these old rusty pipes, we're not going to get a good result. And then what happens is we're very unhappy. It looks as if the problem is on the outside, and it never was on the outside. The way I see it today, my work is to for that to heal. And that, to me, is what the steps are about. And when I started to see that, I started to heal. I changed in ways that I couldn't understand. Because those old messages that we carry, 
whatever they are. Nobody loves me. That one will drive you to some nice events, I'll tell you. (laughs) Because those old belief systems drive you. I never understood why I behaved in such insane ways. I never understood why I felt the way I did. I do now. This is the work, getting rid of this. And again, if you don't believe me, take a look at what Bill says in Step 8 in the 12 and 12, that in childhood we've had these experiences which are buried below the level of consciousness. And I think what happens, you know, because we this isn't therapy. Don't get the idea that what I'm talking is therapy. Therapy, I've had hundreds of hours of that stuff, and I, that never got me sober, and it never kept me sober, and it never made me sane. Because no human power can fix this. See, these old ideas I'm talking about, let's say you take this one, nobody loves you. That's a lie. God loves you. See, the correction for it is not in the human world. Well, my dog loves me. Or my mother loves That's all human stuff. That can pass away. We have to go to the truth of the matter. The life force is within me, and I'm all right now. You see, that's where the healing is. But anyway, we'll come back to that. Because there's a thing or two. You know, and when you read what Bill said, when Bill wrote this, Don't forget, he was about uh, 15 years sober. And he had, you know, as he says, in another thing that he wrote on emotional sobriety, uh, he said, what do we oldsters do? And then he goes on to describe the terror that he had experienced uh, in relationship to... um, his depression. And he says, what was the problem? He said it was his almost absolute dependence on people, places, and things. And he said now, he realized that, and he was able to do the work. And as I said, in one of his letters to his spiritual director, Father Ed Dowling, he said it. He said exactly This is how I got clued into it, because I read this. He's he's talked about his childhood and how his mother had always favored the sister and pushed him aside. And he said, I took hits in childhood, see? And he said, I made a decision. I better be number one. And it's interesting how his life evolved to the place then where he says, I now live in the bright sunshine. And that's why I think spirituality is so powerful. Um, And no human power can fix that. You will be carried exactly to the places you need to be. I'm going to talk a little bit about the steps now. When I uh, got to that place... After that, uh, tw- that uh, d- 21 years sober, I had my sponsor took me through the steps again. And I saw the steps quite different. You know, Scott Peck, in one of his books, he wrote, Alcoholism is a blessing. He said, Everybody is broken, not just alcoholics. Everybody is broken. But he said the blessing of alcoholism is that we are broken visibly. Visibly. They find us in the gutters. They find us under the table in the bars. They find us drunk in the convent. Not a good thing to find. (laughs) They find us sleeping it off in the confessional of the church and interesting places like that. It breaks us visibly. And so he says we are forced into community. 
And I think I would add, we are forced to find another way of seeing ourselves, which is the way of enlightenment, which is the way of seeing God within. So I look at my alcoholism. I took another look with my sponsor, and what I saw was that I had spiraled downward. You know, at first when I was five and took that drink, there were no problems. I just hid and lied and cheated and stole the booze. But as far as making big problems, that was to come later. And so we spiral down to that place where we can't go on. We reach the turning point. And the book says we either accept spiritual help or we go to the bitter end. Have you ever seen somebody go to the bitter end? Anybody? So have I. You know, the people with the gunshot wounds and the people who sit in front of trains and the people who put a bag over their head and end it that way, it's not a pretty sight, and the people who just waste away. So we come to the turning point where either we will surrender and say, I don't know how to do this, or we go to the bitter end. And that's between God and ourselves. And I don't think God ever loses, because I think if, I just think life is an ongoing experience, and if life is so painful, just my idea, if life is so painful that you have to get off and get out of it now, you get other opportunities somewhere down the road. Uh, I think what I learned when I did the steps, it seemed to me this way. I had chosen the wrong solution. See, pain is a wake-up call. Pain is the voice of God rapping, saying, you're, you're out of harmony. You're not in harmony with me. You're going down the wrong road. Wake up. And what did alcohol do? It shut down the voice of God. You take a fire alarm. This is a good thing, isn't it? You shut down the fire alarm, and if they catch you, you're going to jail because people could die because of that. We need the wake-up call. And so my solution for life was the wrong one. Drinking alcohol was kind of like abusing God's goodness uh, to shut down the voice of God. And I think... What I really learned from that, and I'd like to share that with you, is that I'm not the boss. The universe says, you know, we say we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. And I like to use that, those words, but I also like to think of it this way. I'm not the boss here. I can use alcohol to shut down my pain. But it's the wrong solution. I can jump off the 25th balcony to get down to the ground, but it's the wrong way to go down to the ground. And gravity will say, you're going to die. Gravity isn't having a bad day. It's just the way it is. You see, there are laws in the universe. And I am not the boss. I can't tell you how much relief I get from that. I'm not the boss, and neither are you. So right there, I can stop ass-kissing, and I can stop feeling like a piece of crud. They're both taken care of. You're not the boss, I'm not the boss, but I believe there is one. And at this stage of the deal, I don't know who that is. I believe also I'm a guest here. I'm a contingent guest. See? And I should behave like a good guest. I know when I come to your home. I know how to behave like a guest. I don't behave, come in your house and, you know, I'm there two minutes and say, you know, you need to move the furniture and I don't like the painting there and pictures are wrong and I don't do that. So that to me now is the essence. I spend 
at least 10 minutes every morning on step one. Just reviewing this. Because if I leave the house, and I learned it through alcohol, I'm not forgetting about that. But I learned I'm not the boss, and I'm not the boss over anybody that I meet today. So perhaps that's the way then I should learn to treat people. So the question then arises, if I'm not the boss, who is? Who is? You know, it's like getting a new job. And you go into your new job and you don't know who the boss is. Well, the chapter to the agnostics I find extremely helpful in this business of talking to us about the boss. But I'm going to keep it real simple. I always say to, because sponsees, I don't, or other people, you can't live off my experience and I can't live off your experience. You can listen to me and say, okay, I want to try that or whatever. I can listen to you and say, okay, I learned that from you. And then what do I apply? That's the big question. So often, you know, nowadays I find people come and they have no, no, they've never been to church. They just have, they have no anger about it. They just, it's irrelevant. And I just say to them, because by this time, they're probably sober a little while. And I say to them, how is that possible? See, I think of that morning when I got sober, when the compulsion was absolutely in a heartbeat taken away. You know, I am a colossal fool. There was nobody else in the room. If I say, there's nothing there, because I couldn't see it. Isn't that true? You know, you put your hand over a hot, steaming kettle, and you're blistered. You didn't see the steam, but yet it blistered you. We don't see gravity, yet we don't jump off high buildings unless we have a death wish. You've never seen gravity. I've never seen it. Neither has anybody else, and yet we know it exists by what it does. And I think I look at it this way. There I was, hopeless and helpless, didn't have a clue, and that there I was, and I had no more compulsion to drink. What's my conclusion? Some good power was there because Being without the compulsion was better than having the compulsion. And so my conclusion is that's a good power. And if I work at it, you know, and often people say, oh, yeah, I can can buy that. Because, you know, it's like Longfellow wrote a little poem, and it goes like this. I do not see the wind at all or hold it in my hand. And yet I know the wind is there because it swirls the sand. And God is very much like this, invisible as air. And yet we know and see his goodness everywhere. See, what got in my way of developing a relationship with the power was The old way that I saw the world. You were my problem. God was out there. And all that fed into it. Um, Yeah, I think I'll move right on because... Does that make sense to you? Uh, There's so much. That beautiful chapter to the agnostics. Like, I I just read that and read that and read that. It tells me what gets in the way. Give God a chance. Not the God that you think you're going to manipulate. Give God a chance. I don't know how to do this. Help me. 
Show me the way. It's amazing. Just look. If we had continued to believe that the earth was flat, if if the Wright brothers had continued to believe that airplanes wouldn't fly, we wouldn't have a shuttle launch, would we? And look at how limited we are. And I think one of the most unlimiting things is to say, Here, God, I don't know who you are. I don't know. And I sure wouldn't stand up here and try to say, because I don't know. But I know and I have an experience of God. So, then we come to step three, which says, and I'm going to take that kind of from the book, being convinced. See, step three is a powerhouse, but you have to do it. Step three does not say, I have to be perfect. All step three says is, I have to make a decision. And if you are a business person, or professional, or you're a parent, you know you make decisions. How? You don't pick them out of these air. I used to do that drinking. But you make decisions based on the facts, don't you? You take a look at the facts. So we have just had how it works, and the ABCs which follow our description of the alcoholic, chapter 2, the agnostic, and then it says, I can't fix myself, you can't fix me, but God could and would if he were sought. Right? And then it says, being convinced, comma, being convinced of what? Of that. I can't fix myself. You can't fix me, but God could and would. Being convinced, it says, that life, being convinced, we were now at step three. And then it goes on. It's so beautifully written. You know, that life run on self-will can hardly be a success. Isn't that the understatement of the year? (laughs) And it goes on to explain. But there are a couple of things that... You know, I I want to comment on. It tells me there what the root of the trouble is. It's not you. It's self-centeredness. That's the root of the trouble. And the tree grows out of the root. And if I don't want trouble, I've got to get rid of this self-centeredness. And he says we made decisions based on self which later put us in a position to be hurt. And I can tell you this, and you probably can agree with me. Every crisis I've ever had in my life, I can trace it back to a decision that I made years ago, which at the time I didn't know better, but it was self-serving at the time. I want what I want, and I'm going to have it, and it has long arms. You see, but the beauty of that is, is that if you can see it, God uses that process. See, there's a reason why I don't have children. It was a decision I made. You know, sometimes now I think, oh, well, you know, my friends, they've all got grandkids and so on and so on and so on. Why don't I have children? It was because of a selfish decision I made. But you know what? My sponsees always say, yeah, but where are your kids? We need you. And it's true. God never lets us sit. You know, it's like they showed me in, in Oregon you know, where St. Helen erupted and the ash fell and ruined many of the trees. As the time has gone on, beautiful foliage has come out of that. And I think whatever it is where we have, through our self-centeredness, wrecked our lives, uh, God brings beautiful things out of that if we allow that and work with the process. And then he says, our troubles are basically of our own making. That takes, you know, that saves me a lot of time. You're not the problem. 
I am. So I made the problems. I got to clean them up. And he says, we must be rid of this selfishness or it kills us. God makes that possible. And he goes on to say, and this is why I love this book so much. People say it's not well written. I don't agree. From the spirit, the way spiritual ideas are connected, it's magnificent. Because he says, we have to be rid of self-centeredness. And then he says, we couldn't reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own. We had to have God's help. Later on in step six, he connects that because what we begin to see is that everything is of a piece. See, God shows up in our lives in ways, you think about this. See if you can't identify. Any problem that has ever showed up in my life, I'm sure, is the wrong one. Not true? I could handle this, but I can't handle that. How did that come into my life? It's God helping me. It's God showing up, giving me an opportunity to change, to see what where I am at fault, to see where I'm out of harmony with that great life force. And then he says we have an opportunity to to uh, walk under that keystone of the new and triumphant arch to freedom. See, it's not freedom from trouble. It's freedom in God. God is the father, the director, and the principal. You know, I could talk about that. I just think then, step three is a decision. I hear people say sometimes, well, you know, I take it back. I don't. I made that decision that God's way is best. Do I always carry it out? No. And I bet you don't either. But I'm not so stupid as to think after everything that I've experienced that my way is really best and if I can just maneuver it. Sometimes I'm asleep. Sometimes I'm too tired. Sometimes, you know, I just am careless. And I do do my own will. But I'm not saying it's best. I know that I'm going to pay for it. And that's the perversity of the false self, isn't it? (laughs) That you do your own will, and you know as you're doing it, there's going to be a consequence for this. Uh, And then the promises. And I won't go into them except on page 63. We always read the promises on page 84, whatever that page is. Never read these beautiful promises. We have a new employer, and he provides everything we needed, provided we stay close to him and do his work well, and on it goes. And finishes off, we were reborn. You don't get to rewind your life. God, wouldn't that be lovely? You know, we all have those experiences in our life that we say, Oh, did I do that? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just rewind the tape recorder of life and it would be wiped out? doesn't happen. But again, God uses that stuff to bring us to a total awareness, a total dependence on God. That's the beauty of it. And then the beautiful third step prayer, you know, which is part of what I do in the mornings. I get up and... and uh on my knees, and I meditate on the first step. You're not the boss, Mildred. Don't go pushing people around. Don't go hating and criticizing and judging. They're in God's hands. Yours is to be supportive and loving. Who are you going to serve today? And, and so, and then the third step prayer. You know, here I am, God. I'm going out today to do your bidding. And I think we use it two ways because it says at the end of that, it'll have little effect if it isn't followed by getting out the pencil and paper and doing the fourth step. If I'm going to try and live God's way, I've got to know what's going on in my life that really needs changing. And if it's I do it on a daily basis, then, of course, it's what's the, what have I got to do today? 
this morning I did it, and I said, I don't want to go and do this seminar. I haven't got anything to say. And I did the third step prayer. I offer myself to thee. Well, it turns out I agreed to have my name put on the program for this seminar. So go and do it. And if you fall on your face, you fall on your face. Go do your best. Help me, God. See? Now it says we launched on a course of vigorous action. Just one or two things I want to say about step four. I think step four is brilliant. I don't know about you. I've had hundreds of hours of therapy. And in all that therapy, I could give you all kinds of gobbledygook about what they did and how it interacted with me, and now I'm this way. Yes, now, you know, we're going to, and here, I'm still, I'm still the eye cell on the podium, not reconnected. What's the problem? The problem is, I'm the eye cell on the podium saying, you're all to blame that I don't feel good. No, they're not to blame. I have got to wake up and be reconnected to, and I've never been really not connected, but I've got to wake up. What happens through the process of being asleep, I blame you. And out of that comes my hatred. Out of that came my rage. Out of that came my fear. Out of that came the despair. And out of it came all the behaviors that were so shocking. All the behaviors that were geared to manipulating you and getting my way. So we've got three areas. I can tell you, if you do those, and I'm sure you know this, If you do your fourth step and do those three areas, you're going to know yourself better than you want to know yourself. You know, the last time I did the fourth step as part of a process, and I don't think we should do the fourth, I don't ever do the fourth step without going through one, two, three, and then do four. And um, it just seemed to me I had such a clear vision of what it is that I need to change, what I need to do so that God can change me. See, and it always goes back to the dance. We're supposed to dance. God gave us the instincts for sex, security, and companionship. Otherwise, I might sit on the planet as a blob. I'm supposed to learn, and I'm going to learn by dancing with you. And you dance with me, and just like a dance floor, we step on each other's toes, we get our elbows in one another's bodies once in a while, and all that kind of, that's the dance of life. And through that, we learn. And you see, if I don't get it right about who's the boss, then I'm going to be afraid. I always tell sponsees it's the equivalent of going into the boss's office in the morning and you sit on the boss's chair and you put your feet up on his desk and you order his secretary to bring you coffee. Now, you may be insane enough to do that, but I suspect you'll be a little nervous that you may get thrown out ass over tea kettle. And I think that's what fear is about. I'm behaving as if I'm the boss here, and part of my soul knows I'm not. And then in step, then the sex part, sex which is to be a means of loving expression between people, becomes a means of of grandizing the false self. If they want to sleep with me, my goodness, I'm somebody. Oh, yeah, right. And so... That's what the fourth step really is to me. You get to know yourself. Step five, you tell your secrets. Secrets never look so bad once they're out. I remember the first fifth step, there was some pretty bad stuff on there. And I thought, well, you know, maybe some of that stuff I just won't tell. And this priest said, "Are you? is that it? 
And I said, yes. And I started to sweat. Because it wasn't. The real dirt was on the back side of the sheet. So I said, no, it isn't. I said, and I started telling it. And as I told it, I grew six feet tall. I had a freedom that I had never known because I had done, I had completed the task. And I left there just, I can't describe it, it was amazing. It's a principle by which we can live today. There's nothing like honesty. There's nothing like being able to say, I did such and such or this, whatever, to whomever that applies. And then we come to step six. And I think, I think it was um, Scott yesterday who said we lose people in six and seven, maybe. See, I think column four in, in, in step four is there for a reason. Because in column four, I list how I behaved out of line. What's my part? You see, we start out thinking it's you, and by the time we get to column three and four, we see it's me. It's something in me, and how do I behave? And then I begin to see where, uh, you know, the things that I need to change. See, because I think the more realistic step six becomes, at the start at least, there were things in column four, for example, I lie. Imagine that. I tell lies to flatter you. I don't, you know, I don't contribute anything. I make a long face to manipulate you and so on and so on. When I got to step six, my sponsor said, it's right there. That's some of the stuff that you have to change. And I thought I was going to change it. See, I think I've got to change my behavior, I've got to change my words, I've got to change my actions so that God can change me. I give tell you just a little story. I was teaching again by this time, and uh, I was a basket case. You know, I went into that school, I'm Mrs. A.A. They didn't care about Mrs. A.A. They just wanted a stable, sane person doing a job. And I couldn't always pull that off because one day, you know, the emotional roller coaster, I was a year and two months sober. And um, so I made my, up my mind. See, here we go again. I made up my mind. I don't look good. This has to change. God and so I wasn't a churchgoer anymore, but I was quite willing to go to church and see if I could persuade God. So I'd go to church in the morning, and I'd kneel down, and oh my goodness, I'd pray up a storm. God, please, let me be kind today. And the more I prayed, you know what happened? I'd get into the parking lot, and I'd be screaming. doesn't work. Step six is about another level of surrender. You know, I've got to do the changing of my words, my actions, my behaviors, my thinking, and then God uses that process. Just like people say, well, you know, God does the changing. Of course God does the changing. That's a no-brainer. But it's if I want tomatoes, I better do more than just pray for tomatoes. In step six in that prayer, he says, or rather in that little writing in those six lines, am I willing? Sure, God, I'm willing. You can just put the wings on me right now. I'm willing. But there's another little dirty word in there. It says, are you ready? You know, I was willing to come to Orlando a long time ago. But I wasn't ready till Wednesday morning when I closed the suitcase, locked the house, and went down to meet Rick. See? And I think the one thing about step six, if you really want to get the gist of Bill, read step six in the 12 and 12, 
because there he says, why doesn't God's grace work 100% on our character defects when it works 100% on our drinking alcohol? Because I don't want to give them up. Because they're my defense mechanisms. I don't know how to live without them. So uh, there's a whole other thing we could talk about that. I, I think that the process of growth is sometimes seems very slow. But if I continue to do the work, then one day I say, oh, like lying. I would lie about everything. And one day my sponsor and I had a chat, and he said, would you be willing to make this commitment that if you tell a lie, you're going to go and crack it? Okay? And I very shortly thereafter did a real doozy. And I made up my mind, you know, I'm going to honor what I said I would do. And I went back to those people and I told them. I said, what I told you wasn't the truth. I told you a lie so I would look good. And you know what? It broke the back of my need to tell lies. You can pretty well count on today if I say it's black, it's black. And if you say to me, how many people were at the meeting and there were 20, I don't say 50, so I'll look better. That kind of stuff. It's amazing when you take responsibility and hold yourself responsible. In step seven, getting tired, I'll hustle. No, I'll hurry. (laughs) Might be a more appropriate word. (laughs) You caught that. There's only one word in step seven I'll say something about, and that is humility. Humility doesn't mean I'm nothing. Humility doesn't mean I'm not good at what I do. Humility doesn't mean I'm ugly. Humility is not a downput. St. Bernard of Clairvaux many years ago gave us the most beautiful, simple direction. He said, humility is the truth. And the truth is that God is my life. I've made some mistakes on the outside in those outer rings, but God is my life. That's the truth. And as Einstein said, this intelligence that pours out of me is not mine. It's pouring forth from something else. See? From the power within me. Are you going to, are you going to dishonor that power? And if you are a Beethoven and you can write symphonies and you're a Brahms and you are an architect and you can draw beautiful skyscraper buildings, are you going to say, no, they're not good? And are you going to dishonor God in your life and say, oh, no, you know, you know, really? That's not what humility is. Humility is an acknowledgement. And you see, I think then, if we'll do that, we can stand and be counted. Nobody's going to beat me today. Because today, I think, I believe that God is within me, and I live on that identity and that dignity. Make mistakes in the human world? Yes, I do. But in my my essence... I am God walking here just like you are, showing up as you. And so in that, from that place, we should walk with dignity. And I think that's really the essence of that we ask humbly because we're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes. I make lots of mistakes. I think uh, then we come to step eight, which is really about, Bill says, if you'd find that, you know, making the list, etc. And it's in step eight that he talks about these unconscious things that have happened in childhood. Um, But he says, even if you find that you don't have much to do in the way of of, um, restitution, get to know yourself. Get to know yourself and how you function. Powerful, powerful stuff. I'll tell you a little story because I wouldn't have believed this possible. My, uh, I went home one time to Saskatchewan and uh, 
my sister was having a dinner party. And I said to her, who's coming? And she said, um, named the people, and then my sister-in-law, who I don't like. And I said, do we have to have her? And my sister said, why not? And I said, well, she's always so pretentious. I said, she always acts, you know, as if they have so many rich friends and they're so rich and they have so much, etc., etc., etc. And my sister, without skipping a beat, said, she only acts that way when you're around. <laughs> and I learned a whole lot about step eight, where Bill says, get to know yourself. Have you any idea of the energy you put out? How would it feel moving into your energy? You know, I used to have this idea that I was just so such sweetness and light and all this. Then I began to take a look at what it would feel like to relate to me. I thought, whoa, I don't think I'd like to do that sometimes. See? And you get a new look at how you behave. She only acts that way when you're around. Yeah, right. In step nine, we get to the point of making amends. And I think that brings us to the issue of forgiveness. And because I don't think I can make amends until I see clearly. I have to get past the idea that you did it to me. I'm to the point where I think if you do something that offends me, there's something in me that needs healing. And uh, I think that with, if you can forgive the person and be completely okay with, with that peace, then you can go and make amends. But if you go with the idea, well, you did some bad things too, and, you know, I'm going to clean my side of the street, now you clean yours, forget it. It's not the essence of what the amend is. It's about me cleaning my side of the street. And before I do that, I, I've got to be, be right with, with that. You know, people say forgive and forget. There are just three, two things I want to say about Forgive and forget, impossible. If something happened that was really significant, it will always be with you, but you still have to forgive it. But what happens is the sting goes out of it. That's the difference. People say act as if it never happened. It's not helpful. There's a better way, the way of the Spirit. I make mistakes, you make mistakes, who am I to say that you can't be forgiven? I'm the one that has to do the work so that I'm clean inside. And there's there's one other thing that I want to say, and I think a lot of people mistake this. They make a, a mistake between forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration. They say, well, you know, I don't want to have lunch with that person, so I guess I haven't forgiven. Not necessarily so. Forgiveness takes only me. You may have done things, and I don't want to have lunch with you. That doesn't mean I haven't forgiven. The question is, can I see the presence of God in you? That's the issue. If I can see the presence of God in you, regardless of what you have done, then in my opinion, I have cut my tie with you, and I can forgive you, and I can walk away. There are people I don't want in my house. Jesus never said that we have to like everybody. He said we have to love everybody. And what that means, of course, is what the program teaches. I can't shut anybody out. I have to see 
God in you. And it's not dependent on your skin color. It's not dependent on your behavior. And it's not... I'll hustle. No, I'll hurry. (laughs) Might be a more appropriate word. (laughs) You caught that. There's only one word in step seven. I'll say something about, and that is humility. Humility doesn't mean I'm nothing. Humility doesn't mean I'm not good at what I do. Humility doesn't mean I'm ugly. Humility is not a downput. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, many years ago, gave us the most beautiful, simple direction. He said, humility is the truth. And the truth is that God is my life. I've made some mistakes on the outside in those outer rings, but God is my life. That's the truth. And as Einstein said, this intelligence that pours out of me is not mine. It's pouring forth from something else. See? From the power within me. Are you going to, are you going to dishonor that power? And if you are a Beethoven and you can write symphonies and you're a Brahms and you are an architect and you can draw beautiful skyscraper buildings, are you going to say, no, they're not good? And are you going to dishonor God in your life and say, oh, no, you know, you know, really? That's not what humility is. Humility is an acknowledgement. And you see, I think then, if we'll do that, we can stand and be counted. Nobody's going to beat me today. Because today, I think, I believe that God is within me, and I live on that identity and that dignity. Make mistakes in the human world? Yes, I do. But in my my essence, I am God walking here just like you are, showing up as you. And so in the, from that place, we should walk with dignity. And I think that's really the essence of that we ask humbly because we're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes. I make lots of mistakes. I think uh, then we come to step eight, which is really about, Bill says, if you'd find that, you know, making the list, etc. And it's in step eight that he talks about these unconscious things that have happened in childhood. Um, But he says, even if you find that you don't have much to do in the way of of, um, restitution, get to know yourself. Get to know yourself and how you function. Powerful, powerful stuff. I'll tell you a little story because I wouldn't have believed this possible. My, uh, I went home one time to Saskatchewan and uh, my sister was having a dinner party. And I said to her, who's coming? And she said, um, named the people and then my sister-in-law, who I don't like. And I said, do we have to have her? And my sister said, why not? And I said, well, she's always so pretentious. I said, she always acts, you know, as if they have so many rich friends and they're so rich and they have so much, etc., etc., etc. And my sister, without skipping a beat, said, she only acts that way when you're around. <laughs> And I learned a whole lot about step eight, where Bill says, get to know yourself. Have you any idea of the energy you put out? How would it feel moving into your energy? You know, I used to have this idea that I was just so such sweetness and light and all this. Then I began to take a look at what it would feel like to relate to me. I thought, whoa, I don't think I'd like to do that sometimes. See? And you get a new look at how you behave. She only acts that way when you're around. Yeah, right. 
In step nine, we get to the point of making amends. And I think that brings us to the issue of forgiveness. And because I don't think I can make amends until I see clearly. I have to get past the idea that you did it to me. I'm to the point where I think if you do something that offends me, there's something in me that needs healing. And uh, I think that with... If you can forgive the person and be completely okay with with that peace, then you can go and make amends. But if you go with the idea, well, you did some bad things too, and, you know, I'm going to clean my side of the street, now you clean yours, forget it. It's not the essence of what the amend is. It's about me cleaning my side of the street. And before I do that, I, I've got to be, be right with, with that. You know, people say forgive and forget. There are just three, two things I want to say about it. Forgive and forget, impossible. If something happened that was really significant, it will always be with you, but you still have to forgive it. But what happens is the sting goes out of it. That's the difference. People say act as if it never happened. It's not helpful. There's a better way, the way of the spirit. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. Who am I to say that you can't be forgiven? I'm the one that has to do the work so that I'm clean inside. And there's there's one other thing that... I want to say, and I think a lot of people mistake this. They make a a mistake between forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration. They say, well, you know, I don't want to have lunch with that person, so I guess I haven't forgiven. Not necessarily so. Forgiveness takes only me. You may have done things, and I don't want to have lunch with you. That doesn't mean I haven't forgiven. The question is, can I see the presence of God in you? That's the issue. If I can see the presence of God in you, regardless of what you have done, then in my opinion, I have cut my tie with you, And I can forgive you, and I can walk away. There are people I don't want in my house. Jesus never said that we have to like everybody. He said we have to love everybody. And what that means, of course, is what the program teaches. I can't shut anybody out. I have to see God in you. And it's not dependent on your skin color. It's not dependent on your behavior. And it's not dependent on whether I like you or not. I don't like everybody. But I think the more I spend on seeing the God in you, the easier it becomes to like people. And as far as restoration goes, You know, there are certain instances. Restoration means you restore that person to a place in your life that they had before and are willing to build on that. You know, if you're not ready to do that, that does not mean you haven't forgiven. I did it one. uh, My sponsor said when you go to make an amend, you're going about your stuff. And she said, when you go, at the end, she had me write out little three-by-five cards and prepared so I was ready to do the amends. At the end, you say to the person doing the amend that you do, did the amend to, is there anything you need to tell me? That's where the, that's where the real test comes. I was ready. I did this amend to one person, and when I said that, because we've had quite a, a conflicting relationship. And, you know, part of me said, well, when I get done, I'm sure she'll make an amend to me. You know what she said to me? 
She said, you know, yes, there is something I need to say to you. You're a jerk. She said, my father told me there would be people like you on the planet. They talk a very good program, but they don't live it. And she went on and she took a strip off me. Thank God for sponsorship. My sponsor had prepared me. And there was an element of truth in what she said. So I just shut my mouth, listened to what she had to say, and said, thank you very much. I will think about that. And the amend was done. I was clean. See? That's what this is about. And then, you know, I wish I could convince you, if you, if you don't meditate, to meditate. Sing ten because time is time is up. Uh, step eleven says we don't pray for stuff. You see, if we go with this process of spirituality, then I believe God is within me. The spider knows that God is within him, and all he has to do is form an intention, and away he goes, and everything is supplied from within. I said to a young man the other day who came to see me, how much spiritual work are you doing every day? The silence boded not good. He said, well, maybe five minutes. I said, how many hours do you have in the day? And he said, well, 24. I said, how many minutes in each hour? See, Sometimes we have the idea that going to meetings is enough. I don't think so. Step 11 says we work on our conscious contact. I can only tell you this. About 15 years ago, I took up a serious meditation practice. Or I shouldn't say a serious. I took up meditation practice in a serious way. It was after that big crash at 21. It wasn't 15. It was 13. And it has changed, it has been part of changing my life because now I meditate 20 minutes in the morning. I meditate 20 minutes in the evening. And that's as much a part of my life as brushing my teeth. Um, I'm not suggesting you do that. What I would ask is, or what I would suggest is, if you want the eyes of your soul to open, if I want to see the God in you, I can't do that with my physical eyes. I have to see with the eyes of my soul. And the way the eyes of the soul open is through paying attention to that. And so if, you know, getting silent is a wonderful way. You know, like we started here. Because if God is within, that's the voice of silence. I don't have to talk. The book says we don't ask for things. We ask only, what would you have me do? And then we get still and listen. And then we ask for the strength. Help me so that as I go forward, I can do your bidding. There are are two... uh, One... uh, And he's an American. If you're interested, Father Thomas Keating, uh, he's not a member of the program, but he teaches uh, centering prayer, and it has to do with this just getting still. Meditation is just such, such a practice of just being still and knowing, and know that I am God. And you'll find... Life starts to change in ways that you can, because I really believe I can't change myself. I'm a spiritual being. I don't know how to change myself. The program gives me a series of steps, shifts in consciousness that I can do. But I still have to work at that relationship. And it's not thinking about God. It's talking to God. It is listening to what the silence is talking to me. You know, I would say that since I meditate, 
I've become a lot smarter. (laughs) Not smarter in the human world, but because I'm silent, my inner being is more still, I don't make as many stupid mistakes. And often when I've lost something, I hear, go there, it's there, that kind of stuff. It helps in making, anyway, enough. I thank you for coming back, and I'm really sorry that I didn't, but there's a lot to crowd into three hours, as it turns out, and uh, you've been a lovely, lovely, lovely audience. God be with all of you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.